Okay, I think we're live. Setting up these things are a little bit funny. Okay. Um, let's get started. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Today I'm going to be reacting to Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles Boa Constrictor Guide. I thought it'd be fun. I haven't watched it yet. I wanted to watch it. So I messaged Adam, asked him if it's okay for me to react to his video. I thought it would be fun to uh, just see what he recommends, see if I agree with everything, see if there's anything I'd like to add to it, and just hang out a bit and provide something interesting for you guys. Uh, before starting, I just want to say thank you to Adam and mention, like, if you don't know who he is, I'm pretty sure you should if you're into reptile industry. He's basically like the fastest growing reptile YouTuber right now and uh, we met originally when he had about 2,000 subscribers at a reptile show and he came and hung out a bit and out of all the uh, reptile youtuber people that well I haven't met many in person but uh, Adam has always been a very kind person and I really appreciate that when I messaged him to be like hey can I do a reaction video he wrote nope and I was like oh man I just got slammed. I got like shut down <laughs> pretty like nope. And I'm like, wait a sec, wait a sec. Cause I said, uh, is it like, or do you care if I react to your video? And he was like, nope. So I'm like, oh, oh, like you don't care. <laughs> so he's like, he was fine. So let's do this. Let's, let's watch this and let's see what we think. Here we go. Boa constrictors are some of the most popular pet snakes that you can buy, and for great reason. They are amazing pets, so how do you take care of one? Today, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about how to take care of your boa constrictor. My name's Adam. This is Lucy. You're watching Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles. Stick around. Now you might be thinking, Adam, that's a tiny boa constrictor. You're right. Not only is it a tiny boa constrictor because it's a baby, it's also one of the things I want to talk about, the localities. Now boa constrictors come in many shapes, sizes, colors, morphs. There's really a lot to them. But in general, the ones I'm talking about are common boas and true red tails and Central American boas. Now I'm kind of breaking them down in those three categories, but there's a million ways you could break them down. What I'm talking about are the BIs, boa emperators, the boa constrictors or true red tails, and then the dwarf localities, things like hog island boas like you see here. Now let's talk about size as our first category because what's really important with a lot of reptiles or really any pet is how big does this thing actually get? The good news is a boa constrictor is kind of the perfect size if you're looking for something bigger than the entry level snakes, entry level snakes like ball pythons or corn snakes. What's even better news is if you love boas but you just don't want something that might get to 10 or 13 feet, like you'd get with a true BC, you can get a dwarf locality, something like a hog island boa. Now there's a bunch of other insular type snakes. Insular dwarfism just means these animals are on islands, there isn't huge prey items, and therefore they've evolved not to get huge. So a hog island boa, which is a type of BI, they come from right off the coast of Honduras, basically those islands, and these guys are gonna get four or five feet. And I've even seen them as small as three and a half. So think ball python size or maybe even smaller that's what you get with one of these now okay so for instance with uh with all the different boa types there there are some that get a lot bigger there's some that stay smaller but even with these so in the wild as adam said like some will be like get to like five feet 3.5 uh in captivity, 
lots of the time these snakes like unfortunately don't stay <laughs> as small because people overfeed them but if they're not overfed they can they can stay a pretty decent size like my hog island is like eight years old and he's probably like five and a half feet and that's a male so as a female they'll still get they can still get a decent size so it's not like you buy these animals and then they're set to that size. It, same thing with um, like super dwarf retics or even regular retics in the wild. They're not even close to as large because they're scavenging around trying to get food when they can. Whereas in captivity, even these animals that stay na naturally smaller, they still tend to get bigger with the way that lots of people feed them because most people do overfeed they their reptiles <laughs> now if you wanted a regular bi like a boa emperor something like franny here this is a male probably about full grown he's about five years old maybe older and he is going to get to about this size which is about seven feet sometimes eight and then females might get 10 feet but if you get something like a BC, a true red tail boa, you might get something that gets, I don't know, 14 feet. Now this is really uncommon. They'll probably top out females around 10 or 11, maybe 12 feet. And they can be anywhere from, I don't know, a couple of pounds, like a hog island, all the way to 50 plus pounds if you get a really big boa constrictor. Now this might sound confusing. So to really simplify it, if you're going to a pet store and you see a $50 snake, it's probably a BI. If you see something with a really cool red tail, like a Guyanese or uh, even a Peruvian, or my favorite, the Suriname boas, those are BCs. If you wanna know more about morphs and really get into the nitty gritty, I suggest going watch uh, Brian Barchuk has videos, Jason's Exotic Reptiles, Brian Boas. There's a lot of great information out there. I'm just not the right guy to tell you really specific so one thing is, I, I'm not sure, but I actually, I, I don't know, I'm pretty sure that um, B, they're called BCIs and BCCs. So boa constrictor on its own would just be like the whole blanket category. So everything under, so a BCI would be still be a boa constrictor. It's just a boa constrictor emperor. Then the BCC which is what he's referring to as the BC, that is the true red tail. Those are the ones that get a lot larger. So there's the dwarf species, and the dwarf species, it's, it's, it's locality. You're looking at locality. So the big difference between morphs and localities is that morphs, like an albino, an albino can come from anywhere in the world. It can be from any species of boa. It's just having the albino gene in them. So the gene doesn't affect the size. The size is affected by the locality, where it's from, or the subspecies. So when you compare a super dwarf retic to a mainland retic, there's a big size difference. But the... So yeah, so the BCIs, Boa, Constrictor, Emperor, they usually stay smaller. They're more like they're more what we see for sale in the pet industry the bcc those are like the true uh the boa constrictor constrictors they can get pretty big i think the biggest one i've ever seen was in a zoo and it was like it was pretty huge and then the dwarfs the the dwarfs are more their localities like hog island boas they come from a place where as he said, right, there's not as much food or there's smaller prey items and they're just, they're smaller from, because the, they're from that area, right? It's just like we have genetically sometimes, you know, maybe in Europe we have taller people and in Spain we have shorter people and there's still tall and short people everywhere, but there's certain areas that are more prone to have smaller or larger people. <laughs> <laughs> I think larger is more affected by food. But same thing with these uh, snakes. Just because you get something that is that one locality, you might end up getting the freak that gets, you know, larger. And you, same thing, not every uh, true boa constrictor has to get huge. Lots of that is affected by feeding. Okay. <laughs>
specific things if you wanna know really sciencey stuff. If you wanna know how to take care of them, let's just continue. And what's next most important in my opinion, enclosure size and enclosure furnishings, how to put together an enclosure all the way around. Now, if you wanna see a full enclosure setup where I take an empty box and make it into something beautiful, let me know. Put it in the comments section. I'd love to make that for you. But otherwise, it really depends what type of boa you get. If you get a smaller boa, a hog island that gets four or five feet, I recommend you get something bare minimum four feet by two feet by two feet tall because they are a semi-arboreal creature. If you get something like a BI or a BC, I would recommend, especially if the animal... Make a video about that, Adam. <laughs> uh, I didn't... Really? Okay. Adam's saying that BCI and BCC are long gone. It's BI and BC. I didn't know that. <laughs> Send me the research. <laughs> animal might get 10 feet. Get an eight foot by four foot by three or maybe four foot tall enclosure. Because like I said, they're gonna be found in the trees or at least a little bit off of the ground. They're gonna use the ground as well. And you wanna give this animal the opportunity to stretch out as much as possible and get up off the ground as much as possible as well. So in my opinion, the most important things to furnish this are first of all, the substrate, which to me, something that holds humidity. We're going to get into humidity in a second, but they do like it rather humid. So what I use is just a coconut core mixed with a coconut chip product. You can use peat moss. You can use a bunch of different things. But if I had to give you advice and you said, Adam, what do you use? I use a coconut chip, sometimes mixed with a coconut core, and I mist it daily. Next, get yourself a water bowl. These animals do love humidity. They will drink standing water and sometimes use it as a bath. They will sometimes soak in these types of enclosures. So I recommend something that is big enough. I use RO water. You could use water from the tap that is treated or just straight tap water, which I've done for years. If you live in a place where your tap water is safe. And the easiest thing is to put this on the warm side because it's going to evaporate create more humidity, and also it'll make the water warm enough that the snake will want to be in it. Also, give it some hides. Give it some hides on the ground. Give it some hides up above if you are able to do that. The reason I love PVC enclosures, like my friends at Cages who make really cool enclosures, is because they have the option of screwing things into the top or screwing things into the side and still being a very rigid structure where you can't screw in a hide on the side of a glass enclosure. It just doesn't work like that. So if you want the enclosure, the exact one that I'll be using for her, there's a link below and a discount code. But otherwise, it doesn't really matter what type of enclosure you use. Give them perches, give them areas to get up off the ground, whether it's you know made of two by fours or probably would be better as natural sticks. And this offers a little bit of enrichment too, not just because they like to perch and get up off the ground, but it gives them something to do. And I always change up the substrate. I always change up the orientation of the sticks, of the bamboo logs, whatever it is, I change it up to give them more things to do and more things to think about just every maybe month or so, whenever I... Yeah, so... With water, I'd uh, I'd give them something that they like a, a a bin or bucket that they can actually get into if they do want to soak. I, I don't find that they do soak as much as other snakes do, but once in a while you get one that does enjoy hanging out in its water. So it's nice to be able to give them that. It is a little trickier to carry around a big <laughs> bin with water, and um. With putting it, if you put it on the warm side, it will get warmer and evaporate more. I kind of like to stick it right in the in the middle, and the only time that I'd probably take out the big bin and not have it is if the uh, female's about to give birth, just in case you wouldn't want her to have a bin that she could go in and give birth in the water. Even though I've never had that problem or seen that happen. They do climb, so having climbing stuff is very good. Having hides is good, although sometimes, like, every snake is different, so some of them will hide. With most boas, I find that they never really go in their hide. Shelves, shelves are really nice because if you give them, if you're able to build shelves into their enclosure, then they can go on top of the shelf and they can also go under the shelf so they can use it kind of as a hide and something to climb. So uh, Garrett from Reach Out Reptiles did a video a while, long time ago where he showed how 
with the PVC cages like Adam showed you. He built a middle shelf like right in the middle in the back so the snake could kind of like go up in there or go underneath. So being able to give them stuff to be able to get exercise is really good. When it comes to substrate, uh, obviously like that, that would be more natural with what's compared to what they have in the wild. And with adults, that's fine. One, one thing is with babies, I don't like substrate just because things can happen. Uh, little pieces of fiber or whatever can get stuck under a scale, could get in their mouth or something. Th things can go wrong and doesn't mean they will, but it just, it is a possibility. Whereas if you have them on something like newspaper or paper towel, they could still <laughs> ingest it if you were to feed them and they chomped on it. Like, but when you're feeding, you should watch that they don't do something like that. But I just find that substrate is a lot better once the snake is a little bit more established, it's a little bit stronger, or it's an adult. Clean the substrate out. I would recommend against planted enclosures that have delicate plants. If you're using a really natural type environment with natural plants, especially if you get a big 10 foot animal, use really sturdy branches, really sturdy plants. Because if you put in something beautiful in there, I don't know, Ethereums, Pothos, whatever, they are going to crush it. So make it as simple or elaborate as you possibly can. Just give them as much space as possible. The days of offering them a 75 gallon enclosure for a six or eight foot snake are like, if you're a good person, those days are over. Next, heat and humidity. I think this is really important for all animals. Now, I've actually been to the rainforest where these animals are from, where you could find Central American boas. So there is something I'll change in this care guide to a lot of other care guides. First of all, heat, really simple stuff. You can use either a radiant heat panel, you could use a heat emitter, you could use a ball, like a halogen ball that's covered so they can't burn themselves. You can use a heat mat as well. There's a bunch of different ways to do it, but the important thing is getting the temperature gradient correct. Same with basically not every reptile, but most reptiles, you want a cool end, you want a warm end so that there's a gradient and you want a hot spot or basking spot that's a little bit warmer that they're gonna climb on, especially after maybe first thing in the morning to gather heat or after they consume a giant meal to help them digest it. And starting with that basking spot, you're gonna want around 95, 100. Now keep in mind, this is a care guide, not a do this exact care or your snake will spontaneously combust. It's not like that, I'm not gonna pretend it is. If your hot spot is 94 or 102, you're fine because in nature, the hot spot is going to change every day. They're just going to find something that is as close to ideal as possible. The warm. So totally agree with that. Uh, we do get caught up with setting a certain temperature where it's like, you have to keep it this temperature. And in the wild, if you go to a rock and you temp gun it, it's going to be a different temperature every day. And lots of time it'll be extremely hotter or cooler at different times. Uh, lights well, like now we believe that UV and all that stuff is beneficial it's not specifically like, like you need it but it is nice if you can give it give it to the animal but the using lights for heat can be a little bit tricky when you're trying to keep humidity a little bit higher just because the light will create heat but it'll also end up drying the enclosure a bit more than if you were to use a radiant heat panel or a heat pad. The warm side is gonna be mid 80s to low 90s, I'd say 85 to 90. Just try to get it as close as possible to between 85 and 90. And then on the cool end, you can go as low as 80 during the day and as high as 85. But again, low 80s, and then on the other side, high 80s, and then basking spot, 95, 100, something like that. Now, the one thing I would change if I did the video now compared to six months ago is I wouldn't recommend a night drop. I used to recommend night drops for basically everything. Then I went to a rainforest. I went trudging around the woods at 1 a.m. and realized it's still really humid and really freaking hot out. The temperature barely moves in parts of Central America or South America where these guys are from. Now I keep my boas at the same temperature at night as I do during the day. It might get a little bit warmer during the day because all the other lights are on in this room. 
The other thing with the heat drop is that if you were to do, I like some people use heat drops for breeding. They also use heat drops for night. Uh, the the problem, the biggest problem with the heat drop is that if a snake has any food that it needs to digest, it needs that warm spot to help it digest because reptiles don't create heat. So that's why we have to create heat for them. They do they do create like a, a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of heat, but not not the way we do. So when you don't give them a hot spot, that takes like away their body's ability to use that heat to help them di to digest food. And with snakes, if they they can kind of like it's almost like catch a cold or get like a respiratory infection. And it's like when we get something like that, we pass it pretty easily. But when a snake gets, it, snakes are tough. They're strong. It's pretty hard for them to, you know, get sick unless you have them in bad conditions. But the moment that they do get sick, it ends up being, it can develop into worse things. And it can take a lot longer to get them to get better. So why would we want to take away something that keeps their immune system strong? but otherwise no nitrot necessary. In terms of humidity, it's really debated. I recommend 60 to 70% and then give them areas where it gets up to 100%, like a kind of a humid hide, something like that. And so with, with the um, humidity, yes, 60 to 70 is perfect. If you, like when I first got into snakes, ball pythons, boas, everything, they said for ball pythons, boas, you need 50 to 60 percent and like here in canada i have electric heating and every everywhere i've lived it's always been dry in the in the winter when the heating is on so humidifiers help a lot i have a giant humidifier in the reptile room but back to like what was expected like they'd say colombian rainbow boas would need like 70 percent and w with humidity, that 60 to 70% is perfect. As soon as you have it like over 70% consistently, then mold and stuff will start developing. And that, that will cause more problems <laughs> than it being too dry. But the humidity is really good for them. And I think it's probably one of the most under overlooked aspects of keeping these snakes. People let them get way too dry they have problems in shedding they have problems breathing and lots of the time when the snake is going through those kind of problems it slowly starts deteriorating their body and you don't even know it and then five years down the road or something you have a snake that's like slowly dying on you and there's not much you can do because it's just been needing that humidity and not getting it <laughs> also there's a difference between giving your snake humidity from spraying it versus having the right conditions. And it's just like if you lick your lips, you lick your lips, they get dry. You keep your lips moisturized with lip chap or whatever, and then you don't have to lick your lips or spray your lips or anything. Inside the reptile's enclosure, if you are, if it's just getting humidity from misting, you, you're, you, using the water you're getting it wet it goes into the substrate you can use the substrate as adam said it'll you can wet the substrate and that'll create humidity in the atmosphere but i think the best way to have a constant humidity is to use humidifiers keep the whole room at 60 70 percent humidity and then all your snakes are going to be great and you can still mist them and stuff but the humidity is going to be in the air so there is a difference between having that humidity in the air and just spraying it. It has tons of humidity for a bit. And then after that humidity, like it is, you go from lots of humidity to like no humidity and it's a constant on and off versus having just get a good humidifier and then keep the room at the right humidity all the time. And then you're good. <laughs> 
naturally, as the lights go off at night, the humidity is going to climb to close to 100%. That is totally fine. Just make sure that it's not too low. You'll see a little bit of stuck shed on this girl. Just where I got her, I think the humidity was probably a little bit low. So again, if your humidity is 81 or 79 instead for most of the- Look at that humidifier. <laughs> see, Adam's doing it right. Today and then it drops down to, I don't know, 65, you're fine. Just get it somewhere in that area. I have personally found with my larger boa Franny, she'll be out usually at night because they are nocturnal animals and the higher the humidity, generally the more active she is. But that could just be something that I observe because I come down here sometimes at 2 a.m. and other nights I don't. Uh, just take that with a grain of salt. Now I think maybe the most important thing when picking any animal is the behavior. Just simply because if you want an animal that is placid like this one, or you want an animal that's a little bit more moving and grooving like a lot of colubrids, it depends. What do you want? If you want an animal that in the most part, if you get from a baby and who's well socialized, that's gonna be kind of chill, but not really darty, you want a boa. They are going to be nocturnal, that's one behavioral aspect. So they're gonna be out at night most of the time, or some people will say crepuscular, that just means active during dusk and dawn. If I come down at two in the morning, Franny's almost always out. Lucy's almost always out. If I come down at 6 a.m. before the sun comes up, usually they're already back in bed. Now keep in mind, I wouldn't call these the most trustworthy snakes, just simply because a ball python, I've got ball pythons that I've had forever, and they're never gonna bite you unless they think you're food. With a boa, you could still startle them. They're not monsters, they don't mean to hurt you. Just be calm, be confident when you handle these things, because if you get a big boa, just one sec. The TV was turning off on me. <laughs> um, with personalities and stuff, out of all the snakes, I've seen a lot of people have problems with boas for being a little nippy and whatever, but out of everything I've worked with, boas have been my favorite for personalities. When... When dealing with ball pythons, the reason that most people don't get bit and that everyone loves ball pythons is because they are very timid. They'd much rather uh, hide before striking you. Like they're not, they're not as defensive. Their defense mechanism is go into a ball. But I would argue that ball pythons are actually have a lot of that. Like you spend time with them. They open up, and that's literally what they do. They open up, they'll crawl around, they'll look around, they don't have that fear. But lots of ball pythons, even that people have as pets, are scared. And you might not even realize it, but lots of them, they are really scared. So when they're scared, they're, they're, they're not going to be striking or anything, they're going to be more hiding. Whereas boas, if they're scared, they'll strike you. <laughs> they, they won't curl up in a ball. And hide they get scared bam you're gonna get bit they're gonna let you know but at the same time as babies if you handle them from the time they're born and I think that makes a huge difference not just um, kind of the training them out of it or whatever but if you handle them like on day one from the time they're born you spend 10 minutes with each baby you play with their face you handle them and you let them know from the moment they come into this world that, hey, I'm a human, you're going to be spending time with me, I take care of you, I clean you, I feed you, and you put in that time to handle them, then you'll end up with these snakes that are amazing. And I've had so many of them, usually in, a, in like three litters, I'll end up with one snake that's a little bit defensive and nippy, and you can get that out of them pretty easily. But when you hold them as babies, they will just, they'll move around and they'll be curious and they'll, they're, they're more like, hey, what's going on? And they are, they're great eaters. The only time that I'll ever get kind of a little strikey is around nighttime. They are more active. They think maybe they're going to get fed. So you just got to let them know, hey, dude, I'm not going to feed you. <laughs> and the moment you give them a little tap, then they know you're not going to feed them and you're fine. That, but if you just go in and they're excited, they see you and they think to themselves, ooh, maybe he has a treat for me. And it, it, that's the only time you're ever going to really get a nippy snake. <laughs> or if the time hasn't been put in, you do have to put in the time with them 
a little bit more than other snakes. So, but even putting that time in with, for instance, a ball python, I find that you won't get as much curiosity. You won't get as much friendship from the uh, whatever. I need to like forehead. Thank you. Well, and it bites you. Forehead it's not going to be a fun time. It's just really not going to be fun. But I would say nine out of 10 times, if you get a boa that's well socialized, you're going to have great experiences every time you handle them. Diets. Now, this is really important too, but not super interesting with animals like most snakes. Because like most boas, these guys are just going to eat frozen thawed rodents. I don't really see too many reasons why you'd ever want to feed a live rodent or even a fresh killed. Just a frozen thought is easy, it's really humane. I've never had feeding issues with any of my boas. Boas eat like boas, our friend Clint at Clint's Reptiles would say, and that's because they are known for being really, really good eaters. It's not like a ball python where, you know, for five months a year, maybe they go off food. I've never had that happen with a boa. They eat really well. Just keep in mind appropriately sized animals. So the prey item should be about the same size as the largest part of the snake. So for her, she gets weaned rats. For my other, she gets extra large rats. So one thing to add to this, with, a, with breeding boas for a while and having the babies and raising them, knowing that later on they're going on rats, um, rats have larger bone structure than a mouse and also sometimes people have problems if they start them with mice they don't want to switch them over to rats as easily but I changed I changed from feet so I used to think if I want to have them on rats I'm gonna start them on rat pinkies so I used to start my babies all feeding them rat pinkies but the problem with rats feeding rat pinkies all the time is a more mature mouse will have more bone structure than a similar sized rat so when you feed your baby snakes rat uh, pinkies you're just giving them a pile of mush so then what can happen sometimes is it doesn't happen all the time but it does happen sometimes where you'll notice your boa is like it's having like this gray poop that comes out and it looks like plaster or something. So I talked to another, like other breeders that do it larger scale. And one of them basically told me like, just start them on mice. Cause if, if you start them on, let's say hopper mice, a hopper mouse is going to have more bone structure than a pinky rat. So starting, boas especially from the time they're born on mice is a lot better just because you're giving them more bone structure and ever since i did that i haven't had any problems with digesting because boas do have their, their digestive system is actually a little bit um more fragile than ball pythons so starting them on mice is really good for them and then later on you can feed them more um i'm just looking what he's saying right now with babies yeah once a week if they're difficult eaters sometimes i do every two weeks you have to remember that in the wild <coughs> lots well in the wild most of them just die but in the wild snakes they they eat when they can find it and they also have seasons so it's like sometimes they'll have more food during like spring and less food during when we would have winter, but they don't really have winter because a snake, like a boa, can't really survive. Well, like these types can't survive the type of winters that we have here, for instance, in Canada. With with the feeding schedule, so every one, every two weeks, when they see like. Okay, let's, we haven't got there yet, but when you look at an adult being fed once every four to six weeks, I like to feed them every three weeks and then scale down the meal or size up the meal. If you look at the animal's body type, you can see how their body is like growing if they're getting a little bit too chunky, if they're getting a little bit too less. And it's, it's like the same thing with the temperatures. There's a gradient, there's things that change. So you could say when you're feeding a, a baby snake, you're going to feed it a meal, 10% of its body weight, 
and you're going to feed it that every week. Or you could feed it something 20% of its body weight and you could feed it every two weeks. So you see you're still almost doing the same thing. So lots of the guides don't really cover so much the size. It's more the frequency. So you could always choose, you know, one big meal this long or two small meals. And two small meals or smaller meals are always going to be better for the animal. They can handle the larger meal, but it is going to be harsher on them. When a snake eats a meal, its heart actually enlarges and its organs, they, they, they expand and they do what they need to do and then they go back down to size. So when you feed a snake a big meal, it's actually a little bit harder on its system. So I also read a whole pile of like paper. I've always liked reading and researching this kind of stuff. And the, a study showed that like if you feed babies 10% of their body weight versus one meal every two weeks, that is 20% of their body weight, the ones that are fed more frequently, the smaller meals will actually develop faster they'll grow faster so it's the same food intake but the ones that were fed a little bit more frequently actually end up developing a little bit better also there's um but then there's also this other thought so let's say you're feeding every week so if you're feeding every week it's like their body is always digesting like they're always going through that process versus let's say you're feeding them a larger meal they're going through that process a lot in the beginning, but then after they're getting a little bit of a break. <clears throat> so I've always kind of liked that kind of in between. I don't want to feed them every week, every two weeks, but then at the same time, I don't want them to go six weeks without a meal either. So I've always found that by feeding them every three weeks, and then maybe if they were being fed a jumbo every six weeks, just feeding them a large, every three weeks to kind of maintain that kind of perfect body shape and then also going through the motions of the time of the year what's going on so let's say i feed my males every three weeks a medium and i feed my females every three weeks a large but then if i'm going to be breeding a female like two months before i want to breed her i'll start feeding her every two weeks so now she'll be getting, instead of a large every three weeks, she'll get a large every two weeks because I want to put on that size to get her ready to be able to make babies. And another interesting thing that happens with snakes, with like it happens with all snakes. If you have a female and you are feeding them, like you have that schedule where you're feeding them every two, three weeks, once they start developing maturity and lots of breeders do end up overfeeding and trying to get a female to size so that they can breed them i've always really enjoyed kind of just taking care of animals watching them grow naturally and then seeing them go through changes and the females when they're ready to start producing babies they start getting hungrier. They start like wanting more food. And that's one of the ways, you know, my female is ready to breed because she'll, she'll start like being more aggressively hungry, wanting to eat more. And it's, it's like the body is saying, and the snake is saying, okay, come on, feed me. I'm ready to make babies. And she's ready to grab all that stuff so that she can start producing babies. And that's, that's one of the things that I find really interesting, like watching these animals. And working with them because you see them go through different phases same thing you'll see the males kind of go through different phases when they're ready to start breeding and all the breeding that i've done has never i've never used temperature drops i've always done it through feeding and i think it's a really neat and kind of fascinating thing about all these animals the way that they'll react to all sorts of different things and then when they are adults it is nice to also give them different things like you don't only have to give them rats you can give them rats you can give them birds you can give them rabbits and if you have access to all these different food types that's going to be what's best for them because in the wild they'll eat whatever they can kind of catch and that won't always be rodents like you'll see videos of boa constrictors eating iguanas and stuff 
in the wild. In, in, in captivity, it's different, right? But if we have variety, it's always nice to be able to give them that. And even one time she ate a rabbit with no problem. And last but not least, can you even find one? Can you even afford one? Price, availability, and morphs. Now morphs out of the way, you can get albinos, you can get uh, leucistics. There's a whole bunch of different ones. I'm not a morph expert. Again, there's better channels to give you information on that. In terms of availability and price, they're available basically every reptile shop, some pet shops, every expo is gonna have them. And in terms of price, it depends what part of the world you're in. The one bow that I got was free. <laughs> Franny was given to me for free by a buddy of mine who was moving into a place that couldn't have snakes. This girl here, a hog island, she was 250 Canadian dollars. So what's that, seven and a half dollars US. And- it's, it's funny because yeah, there's with, with, they're all different price ranges. And something that, I, I kind of dislike that happens is well like okay so for my hog island was 250 dollars like 10 almost 10 years ago so the price has kind of stayed the same in a way that that's nice because we're still able to get hog islands at a reasonable price uh later on as they you know the numbers dwindle in the wild then those localities will end up becoming more valuable see it's funny because localities in the long run will end up being more valuable because they're going to run out they're not going to be in the wild so we're going to be the only ones that have them which is going to make them the prices go up whereas morphs kind of do the opposite when you see a new morph it's super expensive then people get it they start selling it and then it starts getting cheaper or people make tons of them and then they become even cheaper but what you don't see as much is keepers with like, okay, so I have this morph and it it's worth this much. And I think that it should be priced a little bit more towards, you know, how beautiful the animal is too. Like, so I'll have, let's say I sell ghost boa constrictors for about $300. And then there's one in the litter that I kind of want to keep. I don't need to keep it, but it's like, it's, it's so beautiful. I'll usually be like, this one's, these are 300. If you want this one, it's 400. Bang it up an extra hundred bucks because it's, it's more beautiful. <laughs> like, and with the snakes, that's, that's really what you're paying for. You're paying for the paint job. There's no difference between like, okay, there's a difference between a hog island and a, and a different type of like, like if it's subspecies there's differences in subspecies but like every single bi or bci is going to be the same snake you're not like if the difference between a ten thousand dollar boa and a hundred dollar boa is the genetics the paint job the way that it looks so you're paying for how it looks and lots of breeders seem to like kind of have to okay this is this price or we don't even have a price or you look across in the states and they're actually charging a lot more for the animals here in canada that we actually have less of but people sell them for less because i don't know they don't think that they could get as much and to me i find that kind of weird because you'd figure we don't have as many in canada so when you see it it should be more rare but then we get all these people just breeding them for the sake of it and then trying to sell them for nothing so that's it's it's nice when you're buying something to be able to get a good price but it's bad for breeders that are trying to be able to you know make a living or something i've never bred animals to make a living so <laughs> it's always been a hobby but all this stuff i don't know it's interesting and uh, in terms of regular bcis or bcs like the surinams can get up to 400 it just depends. Just look on Morph Market, look at your local shop. If you have a local reptile shop, you'd be shocked how easily they can provide certain animals like boas or go to an expo. Either way, they're very affordable if you just want a regular wild type or they can get into the tens of thousands for really high-end morphs, but they're really available. You're generally gonna be able to find them in North America and the UK. That's kind of the markets that I know really, really easily. So there you go. That's all you need to know. Well, not actually. This is something I should say to you before we end. Do your research. Just this one bald guy screaming at a camera is not enough 
still do research, still look into things, still get other people's opinions. I'm just one guy, this is how I take care of my boas, but there are people out there who might do things differently. So see what works for you, observe, 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 because reading a care guide and doing exactly what it says is no substitute for observing your animal and making tweaks that you think, using common sense, would be good for your animal. Okay, that's it. If you like videos like this, if this was helpful for you at all, please hit like and subscribe, it really helps the channel. A special thank you to the Patreon supporters who knew about Lucy a long time ago. You get discounts on the merch, you get extra stuff, behind the scenes, all that, for as little as $1 a month, and that's it. Because we do videos twice a week, that means I'll see you on Monday, or Thursday. Today's Monday, so it's Thursday. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> thank you, Adam, for letting me do that, and, uh... Yeah, now we can chit chat about whatever. What's up, everybody? Ah, <laughs> there's Avery. Now I gotta, now I gotta go do research on the whole BCBI thing because that's that's new to me. I learned something today. Unless Adam was joking. <laughs> oh no! Why is that doing that? Okay. I can take the headphones off. Can a snake eat while having its head off shed completely and still how Yeah, of course it can, Ronald. And hi, Nameless Collector. How's it going? <laughs> Let me show you something funny if I can. Um, do, 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 do. There's my baby. Need to monitor capture. We could shut that off. Oh, I don't know. I'm in the middle of. Uh, <laughs> I'm in the living room with a green screen, and it's pretty. It's pretty ghetto fabulous. I, I don't have an iron, so I can't. Uh, that's not true, Mama. I would totally iron it. Ariel's saying I wouldn't iron it. There we go. <laughs> 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 terrible, terrible cough. Okay, let me see if I can. Um... <laughs> I don't even know how to get. I have to... No, I, I'm not even going to mess with this because if I mess with this, I'm not going to be able to figure it out later. <laughs> Okay, I'm in the middle of darkness. <laughs> My boa hasn't shed in like a full month. Can a snake eat while having its head not shed off completely, still having eye caps? Um, here's the thing: people that have problems with okay, now now the Reddit. What the heck is? Okay, there we go. I'm having Reddit issues. So, what was we saying? Snakes. I have two monitors and just getting everything working properly is like strange. Because my boa still hasn't shed in like a month. Yeah, so snakes aren't going to shed every single month. Especially when they're older, they might not shed for a while. So I've never had boa I've never had boas go on hunger strikes. I've had females that are breeding that just don't eat because they're breeding, but also, I never had boas that are in shed that will refuse meals because I don't feed them as often. So if you're not, if you're feeding your snake all the time, then when it's in shed, it might not eat. But if you're feeding them less frequently, then they're almost always going to accept the meal. So as a breeder, if I was feeding my snakes, let's say weekly, I would be going through so much more food, which would cost more, and they'd be just pooping even more, and I already have to clean them all the time. 
So there's to me it's there's a benefit of it's beneficial for their health to feed them a little bit less. It's beneficial for me financially to feed them a little bit less. And whenever you feed them, usually they eat. So it's just all around a good thing. It's not right there. I don't know what is going on with this. This is there. This is over here. There, we're good. Okay. GM. Good morning. Good morning, Ronald. How's everyone doing today? Oh, wow, this actually... <laughs> My green screen looks terrible. <laughs> oh, man. Because my boss is no. No, he hasn't shed. His head only, his body shed completely except for his head. His head still has... Yeah, so you should, you should soak him for... Soak him in, like, w warm water for a cup... Like, soak him in warm water for an hour... Take him out and slowly work his shed off. Because you don't, you don't want to leave a snake with... As soon as you see that they haven't perfectly shed, you should help them get their shed off. Because if you don't, it, it, it can get stuck on them. And if the shed gets stuck on them, it's like... It stops them their skin from... I'm just like... I, I don't even know if snakes breathe. I don't think snakes breathe through their skin. <laughs> Do snakes breathe through? Like, do snakes' skin breathe? Do snakes' skin breathe? I don't. I don't think so. Snakes breathe through skin. Hydrophus. Can, is, can breathe through an area of skin between its snout and the roof of its head, so through its nose. Some snakes breathe through their skin. I don't, yeah, no. No. So, I was thinking, like, we, our skin breathes, so if you cover our skin, it's like it suffocates it. Uh... When snake skin gets stuck on their body, it becomes almost like a scab. And if you don't get rid of it, like if you don't take it off, it, it can actually cause them to have skin problems. Yeah, it says through skin. Snakes also can breathe through their skin. So when you, you have a stuck shed on their skin, it stops the breathing through that area of skin. So you, you want to get that off. Now I want to look up the... Uh, B C C and B C I versus B I and B C. I uh, just I find that so strange. See, like when I look that up, all that gets posted is from nineteen twenty nineteen. He keeps moving because his head, yeah. <laughs> you just, you gotta, you just gotta, you might have to, you know, soak him, hold him, get it off. Like, it's... usually what you can do is you can put them in a container with a uh, moist paper towel and like bunches of moist paper towel and they'll rub around and they'll take it off themselves. So maybe you could put it in a container that has an inch of water in it and a whole pile of balls of newspaper or something so that it can rub it off its own face.
Now I'm like, I don't know if Adam is, uh, I don't know if Adam is serious or if he was messing with me. <laughs> I just, I can't see BCI and BCC being gone. Because Boa Constrictor is such, to me, it covers everything. And everything that was written, everything that was written about them, like, everything. <laughs> like, if we change those terms, it makes, like, everything written about them in the past more confusing. Okay, see, there we got BC or BI. Okay, we got one from 2022. I find I find that interesting. Like anytime something changes, it's interesting. I don't see anything there. What about this? BI or BC? See, <laughs> someone posted a picture with their snake. And it says B I or B C, and then in the comments it says B C I. <laughs> B I. Oh no! Oh no! My TV turns off if it doesn't like see movement, so I had to get up and wave it down. I hold. Bi okay. Now some people call it. Some people are calling it BCI. Some people are calling it Bi. See if I can take him out, and do your best. Yeah. You definitely want to soak him for a while, especially like if he's had the shed stuck on him for months. You're gonna to want to take it off. What is that about? snakes <laughs> um yeah i just did a little reaction video to a boa constrictor care guide that a friend made because uh, basically i i breed boas and everything and i should probably make one too but I just i just i haven't really been in the mood to make as much long form content so every sunday I'll do a stream on the YouTube and talk about snakes, talk about different things, talk to people. But the uh, I haven't had as I ha I have a, a few faithful people here that come hang out with me and talk to me, but I, I haven't had enough people that it's been able to be more interesting. So I've been trying to kind of do different things, so cover different topics, show different have something to be able to base the stream on so that it's more interesting because <laughs> i i'm not good it's far like my wife is very good at just talking and talking i actually do get nervous or feel uncomfortable or it's just like i don't know what to say so i'll get into like i'll go on stream and then i feel like a I feel like a fetus. <laughs> I was just like, oh, I don't know, I don't know what to say or what to do. I get like nervous or intimidated by the uh, the nothingness of the online experience. <laughs> I think I think I do better in in real life. I like talking to people in real life. When you're when you're online, it just it doesn't feel as real. And I, I don't want to like, hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today we're talking about la 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 la. Like it's just, I, I feel self-conscious. I, I don't have that confidence yet. <laughs> yeah.
Can you hear me well? Like, does it sound? Is the audio good? Is it not loud enough? Yeah, like, even... I think you can use mineral oil, but soaking... Soaking works... Soaking works especially well if you get it right away. If it's already been stuck for quite a while, it can be tricky to get the skin off. But if you if you soak it for... If it's been stuck for a long time and you soak it for a couple hours, you should be able to get everything off. And if you don't, then you have problems. Okie dokie. Thank you. Good. I uh, I've messed around with so many different things to try and <laughs> get things good. So <laughs> is there anything you'd like to I don't know discuss or talk about? Just I'm about to toodaloo. <laughs> I'm going to go and ask Adam about the BCBI stuff. Anyone on Reddit got any questions? Okay, well, thank you for joining and have a wonderful day.